thanks everyone for joining. So today's uh, focus is going to be congenital heart disease, one aspect, uh, macro reentrant atrial tachycardia. We'll also visit with congenital heart disease as part of a pathology session. And then subsequently we can look at uh, device management in congenital heart disease later in the year. Uh, several of you have uh, anticipated the session and sent in uh, questions to us. We'll uh, uh, put this up for you, the questions that have already come in in the question and answer uh, folder. But please keep your questions from today, what you hear, what you think about as we uh, go ahead, as many as possible, we'll get to during the session. And what we don't, we'll answer and put it as part of the recording for what will be available on the YouTube link. So today we have uh, Dr. Brian Cannon, my colleague, uh, ex very experienced with ablation in complex uh, congenital heart disease. You've met Brian uh, commenting as a panelist before. He's going to introduce some of the important ideas to get us started in the conversation. And then we'll all, our regular panelists, myself and Brian, and anyone else who wants to join in will tackle the questions as they come up. Brian? Well, thank you very much, Dr. Asarov. It's, it's a pleasure to be here, and um, it's quite an honor to be <clears throat> with such a distinguished group of people. So um, we're just going to start out um, by kind of going through a couple of basic principles about, about adult congenital. And, this is, in my opinion, one of the most important things because it's one of the most difficult things to see. So I'm just going to kind of leave this slide up for just one second. And pretty simple question, what is the rhythm? So you can kind of see there's a P wave before EQRS. Looks pretty good. But let's take a little closer look. And the question is, is, are you sure were your first thoughts about this rhythm potentially correct? Was there anything about the ECG that kind of piqued your interest? Was there anything that changed your mind or your thoughts? Or what are some unusual features? Because if you look at this, there's a pretty flat baseline here, and we see a P wave and a QRS. But now as we look closer, there's some little funny things that are in here. So what could potentially that be? Well, I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about this because I think this is one of the easiest adult congenital rhythms to overlook, but it's also one of the most important. So this is, as Dr. Ashavatham said, called scar flutter intraatrial reentrant tachycardia, a, micro, a macro reentrant atrial tachycardia that we see pretty commonly in congenital heart disease. In fact, we see it in 50% of patients after the Fontan. 30% of patients following mustard or sending, and you can see it basically in any patient that has structural heart disease. It can have thromboembolic complications, and it can be terminated by atrial, uh, by cardioversion or atrial overdrive pacing. But it's distinct from the flutter seen in normal hearts, and I'm going to show you a couple of diagrams in a minute, and there can be multiple circuits, but the key is that the rate is typically slower. It's typically between 130 to 220 beats per minute, which is important in the fact that some of these young people that have normal AV nodes may conduct one-to-one -one through the AV node, resulting in hypotension or circulatory collapse. So in standard atrial flutter, we have a circuit that involves the whole atrium, and it's all healthy tissue that's rotating around in this macro reentrant fashion. So that gives us this pretty characteristic sawtooth pattern on the ECG with continuous electrical activation. That's distinct from intraatrial reentrant tachycardia, where there's a zone of poorly conducting or non-conducting tissue, but there's another area of unhealthy, slowly conducting tissue. So there's an area of healthy atrium that makes a good sized P wave, but then this is, there's this area of slow conduction with very low voltages. So as the circuit goes around, it creates quite a unique pattern on the ECG. And what you'll actually see is this very flat baseline. But if you look closely, you can march through P waves that are there. So at times, it's pretty easy to see. You can see that 
the P waves march through here and you notice the variability of the interval. So when the atrial signals are big and there's atrial enlargement, relatively easy to discern. However, in many of these patients, the atrial signals are very small. So it's very difficult to see unless you look closely. But if you follow it closely, you can see that there are P waves that are marching through. Um, once again, in patients that have other structural heart disease, relatively straightforward to see, but it's important to look at the end of the QRS or in the T wave for hidden P waves, because frequently these patients will have a bundle branch block or other conduction abnormalities. If you look at this ECG, there's a P wave and a QRS. So sometimes you have to look at the whole ECG. You have to look for areas where it slows down or blocks in order to see those P waves come through. So what are some clues to diagnosing IART? These are the things that I look for. So if you have a prolonged PR interval or a variation in the PR interval in a patient that otherwise has a normal PR interval, always think IART. These patients may have conduction de defects and other things that prolong the PR interval, but anytime you see a, an increased PR interval, think IART. Change in P wave appearance. If their sinus P wave always looks one way and all of a sudden it looks different. If there's no variation in heart rate and patients whose typical heart rate is in the 40s and 50s, if they come in with a heart rate of 90, that may clue you in. So a patient that's chronically bradycardic that presents with any form of tachycardia, even what we would consider mild may need that. And the reason it's important because these atrial arrhythmias can definitely affect ventricular function. And sometimes you need adenosine to see them. So if you take a look at this monitor tracing, looks pretty good. But if you look closer, you'll see that there are blocked P waves. So you really have to keep an eye out because this arrhythmia can certainly sneak up on. Same thing with this. If you look closely, you can see that there's a variable PR interval, but when you see a prolonged PR interval, or especially this variability, it tells you that the atrial rate is out of conjunction with the adrenaline effect on the AV net. So if you see this variable conduction, think IERT or some other type of abnormal rhythm. We all have variations in our heart rate, but if you see pretty flat heart rate trends, now you see it won't be perfectly flat, there will be little variations, but you can see in general, if the heart rate trend is very flat, and then when they go to sleep, they have further block, this is another clue. If you see no variability in the heart rate, that you may be in an abnormal rhythm. Sometimes you need adenosine to see it, because here you can see the P waves, but then with adenosine, it makes it much clearer that that's, this is an arrhythmia. So why do we care? It's just an atrial arrhythmia. Well, if you look at the issues, sudden death can be as high as six to 10% and associated with recurrent IERT. And in patients with appropriate ICD shocks in transposition of the great arteries, supraventricular tachycardia preceded or coexisted with VT in 50%. So in these adult congenital patients, these atrial arrhythmias have a significant effect and can have a significant effect on ventricular function. Well, we're gonna move on from talking to IRT to just talk about a couple of basic principles that you absolutely have to do if you're going to take care of congenital patients. The first is know the anatomy. You have to know where things are and just realize that anomalies of the superior vena cava are present in 9% of patients with congenital heart disease, as well as 1% of normal hearts. So you can see here, there's a left superior vena cava. And on this image as well, this is a MRI reconstruction of a patient that I did last Friday. Um, and you can see there's a left superior vena cava. So understanding that and understanding that the signals that you get and where things meet may be in unusual positions is very important. In addition, if you're putting in a pacemaker and there's not a bridging vein, you'll be in trouble as far as getting that catheter into the right position in the heart. In addition, it's important to have some type of imaging. For example, this is a patient who this is the right atrium. It goes from the sternum all the way back to the spine. So you know you're in a, for a long day of ablation. So it's very important to understand where structures are, how big structures are, and other things in order to do a successful ablation. In addition, it's important to know where is the AV node, because in patients, particularly with congenitally corrected transposition, 
or AV septal defect or complete AV canal, the conduction system does not run in the normal area. So if you're not aware of these variations or these changes, you can, ab you can accidentally uh, damage the AV node and cause AV block. In addition, it's important to know the specifics about the surgery. For example, when they say the patient was on bypass, that may mean a bi uh, a biatrial cannulation, where one cannula goes through the SVC, one goes through the IVC, or it may mean a single cannula through the superior portion of the superior vena cava, or it can mean two cannulas that go through the lateral atrial wall. So understanding this will show you zones that where you're expecting scar to be, or zones where you expect diseased tissue to be. In addition, each surgeon does the repair a little bit differently. So it's important to get the operative notes to know exactly what was done, and that will help guide you for your ablation. So um, thank you very much for your attention. Now we'll kind of open it up to questions, and hopefully this will be kind of a primer to uh, diagnosis, diagnosing and treating uh, congenital heart disease. So thanks, Brian. So, you know, that's like... Uh overview for clinician and for uh, uh, electrophysiologists planning a case, what we need to know. And I think when we get into the questions, we'll get into some more specific areas, especially for the invasive uh, electrophysiologists. I'd just like to take, you know, maybe uh, one, which is a very common question and a, uh, common kind of um, mistake that can happen when interpreting the ECG in terms of uh, where we want to ablate. You know, you very nicely pointed out that you find P waves, you look, you see that it is a flutter, uh, that it is, there's more P waves there than what's obvious in front of the QRS. But, Another piece that we have to translate from normal heart ablations is looking at the P wave axis to try and figure out where we need to ablate. So early in our EP training, in our EP career, we learned this diagnostic algorithms based mostly in normal hearts and automatic tachycardia. So if a P wave is positive in V1, and V1 is a right-sided lead, we think that this means that this is originating on the left side. If a P wave is positive in 2-3 AVF, we think origin high in the heart. But I think it's important for uh, us to explain that uh, the analysis of the P wave and re-entrant tachycardia itself is not straightforward, but especially when you're dealing with highly diseased hearts. And the reason for that is that, uh, and maybe I'll just draw something here. The reason for that is in the reentrant tachycardia, there's really always some electrical activity somewhere in that atrium or ventricle for VT. So there's no real focus that will determine what the P wave axis is. That P wave, part of it is going to be one part of the circuit, another part of the heart that's getting activated late, early. It's really almost impossible to make sense of the P wave in diseased hearts reentrant VT. But one of the uses that there can be is because it's so diseased, that diseased portion doesn't contribute to the P wave, it's electrically silent. And what really makes the P wave, however small it is, is from where that circuit exits to the rest of the heart, that's relatively normal. And this can be a specially useful clue in congenital heart reentrant tachycardia because the circuits are in such diseased portions, low voltage can't generate enough of a voltage stream to be part of the EKG. Where you do start seeing it gives you an idea of that transition between the normal heart and the diseased portion that's housing the circuit. So kind of a, a way of interpreting is to say, let me do my usual electrocardiogram analysis, but then let me interpret it differently here by trying to back in from that exit site 
to where I'm anticipating the type of signals and abnormalities that's going to help me find the circuit. So, um, you know, that's, uh, that's one frequent question that comes up. There are a few others as well that we'd, uh, I, if we have time, we'll get, get to. But we have some that I'd like to get started with as questions. And anyone here, please do add in uh, anything that you'd like to look through. So one of them is uh, a very important question, and that is, how do we figure out, how do we figure out how to check for block when doing linear ablation in patients who are post-op congenital heart disease. So, you know, we've gotten used to saying, how do we check for block when we have normal heart, bidirectional block? We're putting a catheter, multi-electrode, wavefront two ways and see if there's a reversal of conduction. But how do we figure that out in patients who've got uh, congenital heart disease, difficult to access the anatomy, and uh, is there bidirectional block after uh, the ablation that we've done? So maybe I'll just open that up a little bit for comments. I see we've got um, Malini, who's uh, Malini Madhavan, who's also very experienced in congenital heart ablation. And maybe I'll just start with you, Brian. Uh, comments about like, how do we, uh, look for block when we can't get easily to those structures that we've done a linear ablation on, and then we'll get some comments from Dr. Madhavan. Yeah. I think that's an excellent point. And I think that's one of the most challenging things about these ablations is there are multiple lines of block and multiple can be circuits going through there. So I think it's important, at least when I look at it, is to do spend your time and your due diligence in mapping before you do an ablation. See what the activation patterns are. See if you can find areas of scar or areas of low conduction. And that may help you plan your ablation lines as well as, as check for a block. But it, it can be very difficult to figure things out. And another important thing is, is having some type of imaging, whether that be ice imaging or a CT or an MRI before to make sure that you're mapping the entire circuit. Because one of the biggest problems that we run into is there's an area of the circuit that's critical that either you can't get to easily with your catheter, so you miss it with the mapping system, or is completely blocked off from access based on the surgical results. So Dr. Madhavan, I don't know if you want to add anything to that or... Yeah, that's great. Um... In terms of checking block, I would just add a couple of other things. Um, checking block across lines after atrial flutter ablation is the concepts are very similar in ACHT versus compared to someone who doesn't have congenital heart disease. But there may be challenges, right? So because sometimes uh, pacing from certain portions of the heart, such as access to the proximal CS, may not be present, but the concepts are very similar. So if I can share a couple of slides, Dr. Asavatham, if that yeah, would sure. be okay. Yes, please. And, um, I'll just show a couple of examples of um, checking block. Um, just a second here. Is that coming across? Yes. Okay. So the most common way we check for block across a line is probably the best way I would say is to place a closely spaced multi-electrode catheter across the line. So that's the most common way. And we want to pace on either side of the line and show that the activation is occurring on the other side of the line in a reverse direction. So that's the concept we apply for checking for CTI block. And the same concept would apply for any line that we perform in an ACHD uh, flutter ablation, or for that matter, any VT ablation, like in a tetralogy as well. Um, some of the other ways this can be done is, this is, for example, a common type of flutter. This is a right atrial map. And the uh, second most common flutters we see in these patients after CTI flutter is incisional flutter occurring on the lateral right atrium. So on this map, you're seeing the lateral aspect of the right atrium we have ablated through a pre previous surgical scar, 
and anchored this line to the IVC. And this previous surgical scar start, started at the base of the right atrial appendage that you can see here. So it really wasn't anchored to the SVC, but was anchored to the IVC and that terminated butter. So then another, one of the questions is, is there block across this particular line? So the way we check for this is instead of putting the catheter across the line, the uh, multi-electrode catheter was placed on one side of the line, straddling that line in a uh, up to down fashion. And then there was spacing from the ablation from the other side of the line. So in this tracing here, you're seeing pacing from the ablation catheter and the isthmus catheter, IS catheter here that's labeled here is getting activated from top to bottom here. So uh, IS1 is on the top and IS1920 is on the bottom. So there is block across this line. So the activation is going around to the right atrial appendage and then coming back. So there is block across this line. Similar concept if we do an intracaval line. We can either place a catheter across the line or we can place it parallel and show that there is block across the line. The other way to do this, if there isn't some way of placing a catheter across the line, is to pace one side of the line and then map on the other side. So uh, this is another example and this is a map from a patient with a mustard procedure who had a CTI ablation. So what we are seeing here is we have done retrograde access into the pulmonary venous atrial side. And then through the IVC, we have gone into the systemic venous atrium. I don't know if my, um, is my arrow coming across? Yes, yes. Okay, so this is a map of the systemic venous atrium and this is the map of the pulmonary venous atrium. So although this was CTI flutter, in this particular situation, the large part of the cavotricuspid isthmus is now in the pulmonary venous atrium, which is the opposite side of the baffle that the surgeon had put in. And the coronary sinus was also located on the other side. So what we did for this patient to check for block was we paced from the medial side of the uh, CTI line that we had done in the pulmonary venous atrium. And then we took the ablation catheter and using the mapping system, mapped the activation sequence. So you can see the activation sequence is earlier away from the line, which is the red dot. And then as we come closer and closer to the line, it becomes later and later, which is the purple dot, right? Mm -hmm. So that's another way you can check for block across lines in patients who have difficult access to certain chambers. So, um, but the concepts are similar. You're pacing on one side of the line and mapping on the other side, whether that's using a mapping system or using a multi electric catheter. Um, it depends on the situation and where we are ablating. And then Thank we can you. also, Dr. Asurvatham, if uh, we can also talk about how to interpret doubles and all that later, if that's, uh, that's of interest. Yeah, sure. Thank, thank, thanks a lot. So, so just to kind of uh, explain this uh, two approaches to be sure everyone's on the same page. So the problem with uh, our congenital heart disease patients is we draw lines in places we're not accustomed to doing. So we have to have like a generic game plan for how can I check for block anywhere. The second is, it's not easy where we drew the line to place more than one catheter. If we had to go through a baffle puncture, a retrograde approach, it can be difficult. So Dr. Madhavan here has pointed out two things. Let's say this is where we've done the ablation, somewhere in the atrium, could be in the ventricle. And we want to know that there's no gap here because the premise is this has been anchored. We haven't anchored to both sides, two anchors, because we didn't want to isolate or delay conduction entirely to one portion of the atrium. But we don't want to have a way for a circuit to make its way back. So in that example that um, Dr. Madhavan showed, there was anchoring to the IVC. So how to know that this line is blocked? So simple one there, there's you pace on one side of your line and you have at least two, preferably a multiple electrode or even just a proximal and distal electrode from a single catheter. You pace here 
and see how is the activation to these catheters. If it's coming like this, chances are this is blocked and the activation is coming down. If on the other hand, you are leaking through, then this will come earlier. But very difficult to use this technique with just single catheter or a few points because anybody can distinguish conduction from block. The trick, the talent, the skill is distinguishing block from almost block. So extremely slow conduction. So if we are using this technique, we have to make sure that the catheters are close to where the conduction might be happening and try to take closely spaced catheters to show the entire wavefront, even close to where this line was created is reverse activated. And to exaggerate that further, you want to pace close to where that line is as well. So in other words, you're trying to make it best case scenario for conduction to occur if it's possible to occur. Now, some, the second technique that Dr. Madhavan pointed out was you don't even need to have a multi-electrode catheter on the other side of a line. As long as you pace on one side and you can map on the other side. So just take several points and show that even though you're pacing, all the conduction is moving towards where you did that line. So here also a few caveats if you use this technique is you have to make sure that you're pacing close to, but not too close to the line. Because if you're too close, you might inadvertently capture tissue on the other side. Second is your map should be strictly only on the side of the line that you're checking for block. If by mistake, you interpret a signal from this side or you take a point on this side, it'll become an entirely meaningless map. So you can do it, but with those caveats. And the nice thing about uh, that technique is you can do that even in the ventricle. So this is an example of a patient with post tetralogy of fallow VT. And a line was done connecting a patch, a non-transannular patch to the pulmonary annulus and want to know, do you have block there? You know, good luck with trying to get a multi-electrode catheter there. So one way to do it is simply take a pacing site and that pacing site might be in the other ventricle. It could be a second catheter keep pacing from that same location, and then map on the other side. Here's your line, you're pacing close to the line, and the whole wavefront is coming towards the line. And if that's happening, you can say you have block in this direction. And then what you can do is just reverse this, pace here, do the map on the other side to show that you have bidirectional block. So that's uh, some of the things we you would think about you know, there's an allied question that also comes up sometime is what can you anchor to in patients who have congenital heart disease? So this is actually a very important uh, question. So you can anchor to anything that will not conduct. That's our premise for when we say anchor. So not possible to conduct. And that usually is valves in the normal heart. But in congenital heart disease, a potential pitfall is when we have a scar. And the scar, we say, let's anchor to the scar. This is a very frequent cause of recurrence of arrhythmia because what we call scar is not really scar. So in other words, we might have defined scar as this is something with lower voltage and with some arbitrary cutoff. But little living tissue could be there and then when we draw a line here, you can force conduction through that little living tissue. And this can become an incessant slow flutter. So if you call something scar while doing a map, thinking that I might do a line to connect to that, you have to be 100% sure there's no viable tissue there. 
That's why many electrophysiologists, even if they think it is scar, they'll actually ablate all across that to kind of make sure or homogenize the scar to be sure that that really has no viable tissue into it. The other kind of unique thing that comes up in congenital heart disease is sometimes as a result of the surgery, there may be isolated portions of the atrium, isolated portions. This has its own rhythm. It's already been isolated from the rest, even though this is entirely viable. This is a potential anchor for a line. Because this is isolated, it's not going to go anywhere. It can be treated like scar, even though you have viable tissue. And there's also another unique situation where the isolated portion might be in a rapid rhythm, like fibrillation, even while the rest of the heart is in flutter. I don't know if any of the panelists here have a, a quick example to share. Otherwise, uh, I can find one as well. But um, uh, if anyone does, let me know. Otherwise, I, I have one here, Dr. Oh, you do? Okay, you great. Why, uh, why don't you show that uh, to us? Let me get rid of this so you can actually see. There. No, that's okay. We, we can see it. That's beautiful. That's a beautiful example. So maybe I'll just talk through this one as you point, Malini. So if we look at that inset, we see that even though there's an organized arrhythmia, uh, in one portion of the atrium, there is fibrillation. So how can this fibrillation be an anchor point? Well, how come the fibrillation hasn't spread? So effectively, this could be an isolated portion. Now to know for sure, this is only valid if the rest of the atrium is in a paced rhythm, a stable flutter, or in sinus rhythm. If it's a flutter that's changing, then it's iffy if uh, whether this is a good anchor because there may be conduction. It's just slow and delayed, and that's what's changing the organization of the flutter. Thanks, thanks, Malini. That's a that's an exact example of what we had in mind. Now we have a question, uh, and I believe. So uh, if, if I could just make a, a, a just a couple of quick comments. First of yes, all, I think it, sometimes it can be challenging figuring out which arrhythmia is the clinical arrhythmia and if there's a connection in between the two. So sometimes you have to spend time doing that. The second point is, is sometimes the most obvious area to connect involves a very large portion of atrium. You have to look at several different options, including going through old areas of scar to potentially look for ways to not damage the other atrium, because you can cause atrial dyssynchrony by putting too many ablation lesions in there. And sometimes these patients are very dependent upon their atrial kick for their cardiac output. So I think your points are excellent about trying to figure out that. And then, but you have to map and figure out what's the clinical arrhythmia, what's the best route to get rid of it so that we can leave the limited amount of healthy tissue that's in place intact. Great, thanks, thanks, uh, Brian. So we have another question, kind of generic. It's like, it's difficult to interpret signals in congenital heart disease annotate the signals, uh, uh, et cetera. So difficulty with signal interpretation. Uh, I think this is also a very important point and we'll get uh, some uh, uh, multiple opinions here. Uh, but I see Dr. Del Carpio has joined uh, as a panelist and I know he's uh, given a lot of thought to signal interpretation and how we include in a map. Freddie, do you want to share some thoughts with us? Well, mm -hmm. when uh, mapping, you know, the atrial flutters, um, typically we want to deal with complex signals. Um, we want to make sure that we annotate right the activation sequence of the local atrial electrogram. So the difficulties are typically dealing with double potentials or, so there are difficult, different strategies, um, but we want to make sure, you know, that we annotate the near field signal all the time. Okay. But sometimes that's not possible. So, uh, for example, if we have a fractionated electrogram. Yes, uh, Freddie, I think you're cutting out. I, I think I know what you mean. And uh, let me 
share an example of uh, 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 Freddie, you're, what? you're you're cutting out. I'll I'll just share an example with the thing of what I think you're uh, referring to. So you know, sometimes sometimes what we'll what we'll get is uh, something we're used to now a little bit more because we're doing structural heart VT, but it's a very important principle for especially new electrophysiologists. The smallest signals are sometimes the most important to kind of have an understanding of and recognize in a tachycardia. So especially with congenital heart uh, arrhythmias, you have to be really cautious about saying, is this scar or not? And recognizing that there may be a big signal on our catheter because surrounding tissue might be what's contaminating the signal. And the real critical signal might be something in between. So these kind of fragmented, fractionated signals. I'll just give a few tips from my own practice and then we'll hear from uh, Brian and uh, Malini as well. But one of the things that's useful is understanding where is your catheter. So in a con congenital heart VT, for example, if the catheter you know is in a position where multiple structures are, papillary muscle, overlapping changers, ch chambers, near a baffle, in those circumstances anticipate that there could be two sets of signals. The second thing that comes into it is ask yourself, which of these signals is more likely to be relevant to this circuit? So in other words, you look at the ECG, you look at the cycle length of the tachycardia, and then look at the signals that are present in the catheter. You have the surrounding tissues already mapped. Which of these signals fits best if this is really completing a circuit in that location? But beyond that, I personally find the most important maneuver is pacing. So if you pace from that site, when you have that luxury, you're not worried about the arrhythmia changing. When you pace, see what it is that you capture. And if what you capture is what is allowing perfect entrainment of that circuit, then that signal is relevant and that's the one that you need to include. Now, sometimes we just can't tell. It's like, you know, which one do you want to go with? This one or this one? Which component of this one? It's good to just step back and say, I can't tell. And just annotate on the map that there is a location where I couldn't tell. And I'm just going to say, this is an abnormal signal. And then when you have the rest of the map, you can come back to that location and see, well, now can I tell, looking at what else is around that. So just some things to share about uh, one type of difficult signal, small, but maybe high frequency and fragmented signals. Uh, Ma, uh, Brian, any uh, comments about signal interpretation and then Malini? Yeah, I, I think that, that could, this can be one of the most difficult things and the most one of the most surefire way to derail, derail your case is to have a map that doesn't make any sense. And so I think you have to be very careful when you annotate or use auto annotation programs just because it may not be annotating the right thing and especially lines of block and other things can really throw your map off quickly. So I agree with you. Any points you have questions about or double potentials you should probably just take as a location and then come back and look at that in the scheme of things because you can get a completely different map depending upon where you take the points individually and trying to figure out what small signals are relevant and not is something that can be difficult. But I agree, I think pacing and looking to see how those signals respond is, is very important. Um, Malini, before I get a question, a comment from you, I just want to share quickly another situation where this is important is uh, when we are, uh, when we're ablating, I'm sorry, when we're ablating accessory pathways and we have in congenital heart disease, sometimes a situation where we have 
to try and figure out for our map just the simple concept of early site or early activation location. So there are some very simple maneuvers can be very helpful, also related to pacing. So you have, this is a patient with Epstein anomaly and accessory pathway ablation. And what you wind up is we're trying to map for a pathway potential early V. And you also know the atrial signal can be complex and multi-component, the ventricular signal can be complex and multi-component. So sometimes while we have all the signals of interest in line, we pace to just change something like block in the pathway. And then everything that was related to the pathway is going to move. So then you just backtrack from what moved back to your original beat in whatever electrodes you have, even if it's a very small signal in one electrode like this one here, you'll say that's related to the pathway. It's V or it's pathway potential related to the pathway. So another unique challenge in congenital disease where you sometimes even a so-called simple arrhythmia, though because the signals are complex from surgery, maybe prior ablation, good to have a few uh, maneuvers up your sleeve that you can use. Mal uh, Malni, you have an example to share with us? Oh, you're, you're still muted, I think. Sorry about that. Yes, sure. I, I can show, uh, show an example, maybe to highlight um, what you and Dr. Cannon said about pacing to help distinguish which signal is relevant. And I, I think uh, it's worth, again, emphasizing what Dr. Cannon said about these automatic annotation programs. I think they are good, um, but they're not good enough to always know exactly which component of a multi-component signal is of relevance. So it's really important to pay attention. I always tag some of these multi-component signals as location only, come back, pace, and figure out what is of relevance to the circuit. The other thing to keep in mind is when we try to pace, it's really important not to pace too fast, much faster than the, um, uh, the cycle length, uh, going about maybe 10 to 20 milliseconds shorter than the cycle length rarely leads to degeneration or changes in the flutter or termination of the flutter. So pacing maneuvers and trainment maneuvers can be extremely helpful, but just need to be used very carefully, making sure that we have good sensing when we start pacing and we are not pacing too much faster than the uh, underlying flutters, flutter or any other VT we are mapping. So Thanks. this is one example where there is a multi-component signal. We can see there are three different components uh, on this electrode. And when we pace, we see that two of those components actually are not getting captured. And it is this third component here with the red arrow on it that is actually getting captured. Now we know exactly what is the relevant signal at that site, and we can annotate to that. Um, and it also tells us that this is a, probably a, a site that is relevant to the circuit and likely within the circuit based on the entrainment we have just done. Um, so I do find it very helpful. Entrainment is very helpful to sort out which signal is relevant. Great, thanks. Um, now, uh, uh, maybe while uh, I'll ask someone to just check with the doctor who's asked a uh, question if they'd like to just ask the question online about uh, atrial fibrillation making arrhythmia difficult and we'll come to that in a in a bit um, and we'll maybe go to another question here it's uh, has to do with uh, coronary sinus position in congenital heart disease any principles anything where we look at to say of uh, where it's important to know before going into the procedure, how to anticipate where the coronary sinus is. Maybe Malni, I'll ask you this question. Um, I, planning before the procedure is really critical with any kind of repaired congenital heart disease and part of the planning is knowing where the coronary sinus is. So I routinely um, either obtain a CT or MRI 
or if it is if there is already one in the system, I would review it in detail with the radiologist to really figure out, depending on the complexity, things like where is the coronary sinus opening into. Um, if it is something very complex like Fontan, um, you know, which part of the atrium has been excluded, how to get to that portion, is there a fenestration? There are so many aspects to this planning, but coronary sinus catheter, uh, you know, knowing where the CS is opening into is really important ahead of the case, I think. Um, during the case, ice imaging is also really important, so that also helps us really know which part of the chamber the CS is opening into. And that becomes more relevant in patients, uh, for example, with a mustard procedure, where the, uh, at least in my limited experience, I find that it's about 50-50, 50% of patients that I have seen have the coronary sinus open into the systemic venous side and 50% on the pulmonary venous side. Fontan flutters would also be very important, knowing where the CS opens into Another uh, reason to know that is if somebody has had tricuspid valve replacement surgery, um, knowing the C if the CS is atrial or ventricular to the replaced tricuspid valve can also be very helpful ahead of time. So it helps us plan how to place the uh, CS catheter. I Most of my cases, I place the CS catheter from the uh, IJ. I find that to be the most stable uh, location for a CS catheter. But if it's a coronary sinus that is ventricular to a replaced tricuspid valve, I tend to do that more often from the uh, leg. I just find it more helpful that way. But it, it is really critical because whenever we are mapping something in the atrium, uh, the CS is often our um, reference electrode. The other uh, trick to some of these cases is if we have a patient where the CS is not accessible and we are unable to place a reference electrode in the CS, uh, one of the things I do is use a screw and atrial lead. So I take a regular pacing lead, place it through typically the IJ or the subclavian vein, and then screw it into some part of the atrium. And then that is uh, uh, connected to alligator clips, through alligator clips to the uh, CARTO system or whichever mapping system we are using. And that would serve as a very stable uh, reference for us. Having a stable reference is really uh, important before we start mapping and figuring out ahead of time what a reference is going to be uh, as part of the planning process. So Malini, I'll just share this uh, image here while we go to the next question. This is what uh, Dr. Madhavan was uh, mentioning. Uh, are you? Oh. Okay, no, it's okay. No, I think it's yours. Yeah. I'll... Get that back here. So this question of where is the CS to identify, I think it's important for a couple of different things. You know, one issue that comes up is CS is our landmark for AVNRT ablation, so slow pathway. So it's not always just access to the CS, just the anatomic location of the CS can be important. That's useful to know from imaging. One useful thing is if the patient has had a coronary arteriogram, sometimes if we can look at the, the venous phase when they had the arteriogram, that'll give you a nice clue. If there's been a CT, that's useful. But this is what uh, Dr. Madhavan was mentioning about CS positioning in patients with DTGA and, a ba and an atrial level baffle. So this is really kind of surgical preference. So it's not so much that the CS is misplaced, it's just where the suture line is. So if it includes the CS, then you can only access from the left-sided circulation. If not, you can even place a bi -V device through the CS in patients whose CS is not included in the baffle. You also have these like kind of in-between situation where you may have a part of the CS on one side and part of the CS on another side. Few surgeons do that, especially in the uh, middle period for the mustard and sending procedures. And so sometimes you might be able to get in, but there's still part of the CS on the other side of the circulation. But just getting that orientation for the uh, anatomy uh, can be can be important. So allied question also is 
you know, which situations where we have to worry about AV node reentry. I'll just make a quick point here. Relationship to the CS and the AV conduction system in most normal hearts and in most congenital heart disease is fairly consistent. You'll see the CS is posterior close and, clo and inferior compared to the compact AV node. And the CS starts out relatively atrial to the compact AV node, and then winds up being more ventricular to the compact AV node. It's a good rule of thumb to keep even in congenital heart disease. But sometimes there's a disjoint. And what that disjoint comes down to is when there's a defect in the normal location of the compact AV node. So a defect in the triangle of Koch. And this is our primum ASD complex with endocardial cushion defects that this is punched out. This is the defect, part of the defect, all are part of the defect. But yet these persons don't have AV block. So what that tells you is the AV node has gone somewhere. And that's very difficult to define, but pattern-wise, most of the time, the AV node is displaced posteriorly and will be located not juxtaposed to the coronary sinus, but in the coronary sinus in the same region where either the coronary sinus is or where you anticipate it to be. So this is kind of one rule to keep in mind. This particular set of conditions, our safety of ablating in the coronary sinus is gone. So we have to think about more difficult ways, more involved ways to try and figure out can you ablate there or not. So, um, you know- Sam, Sam can I, can I I just want to show just one example, if that's okay with you. Perfect. Um, so this is, it is important to know where the coronary sinus is and realize that the coronary sinus can be atretic. So as Dr. Madhavan pointed out, um, a lot of times it's important to know where this is. You can sometimes see it with ice. Another thing that you can do is, as Dr. Asherbotham said, is shoot a coronary angiogram and watch it on the levo phase and see where the coronary sinus fills. Another thing to remember is that the left superior vena cava that in most people uh, disappears in embryology connects to the coronary sinus. And this is where it is, where it normally will absorb to creating the anominate vein. So shooting a picture in into the left IJ or into this anominate vein can, a lot of t uh, can frequently show you the anatomy of that. And in addition, there are, there are several... Um, there are several things, and I can send this link out, but there's different publications that will actually show you, just as Dr. Asherbotham said, what about congenitally corrected transposition? What about an AV septal defect? They will actually show you pictures of where the conduction are. So if you're not that familiar with it, there are resources that you can go to to figure it out if you don't know off the top of your head. So maybe uh, we'll try and do one more question live. And then we'll definitely get to the others and keep that as part of the uh, 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 session. So quick one uh, here is typical flutter ablation when there's a prosthetic valve or a baffle, how to kind of tackle that. And I think we'll maybe address some of the nuances of that on, uh, offline. But uh, any quick comments, uh, maybe Brian, you want to make on this? Sure, I, I think it can be very challenging. Um, I think if you're careful with, you wanna to try to not pass your catheter through prosthetic valves, although in unusual circumstances you can. A lot of times there are different areas or different crevices around there where they place the valve that you can actually ablate that tissue without actually going through the valve. So I'd be also interested what any of the other panelists have to say about their experience with artificial valves. Great. Why don't we plan on um, uh, looking at that issue in, uh, in more detail uh, offline and we'll post it on uh, the YouTube link. I think it's an important question and many things are uh, associated with that. Uh, Abhishek, you had a quick slide to share with us. Yes, I can just show this one example again where uh, 
sometimes it is difficult to access or have a block across the CTI if there is a valve which is located uh, which is present. I hope you can see it. And yes. sometimes you may have to actually cross the valve because there could be some atrial tissue which is hanging out, you know, a little bit ventricular to the placement of the valve. And you may actually see an atrial signal here like this distal to it, which can be targeted for ablation to have a block. So sometimes you do have to map beyond the valve to look for any atrial signal. Great. Um, uh, so, you know, really nice questions. And I know we didn't get to everyone's, but please keep asking and feel free to send us. I did see the uh, couple of the questions uh, come in just now and we will uh, get to them. We'll uh, answer them now offline and please do uh, use the link for the recorded session and which will also have this additional, I would guess it would take us about 20 to 30 minutes to discuss the remaining questions we didn't get to. Thanks everyone for joining. Brian Malni, thanks for joining in as well. So we had several questions that we didn't quite get to and we'll try to answer, uh, answer some of these uh, questions now. Um, so one, one question that came up that's uh, what isn't related specifically to congenital heart disease, but one of you wanted to know when doing cryoballoon ablation uh, or for that matter, any type of ablation and you want to check entrance and exit block into the pulmonary vein, do you have to cardiovert the patient or not? So, uh, Siva, any thoughts on that? So, entrance block, you know, if you see signals go away all at once, potentially there is entrance block. Exit block is kind of difficult to demonstrate if the patient is in atrial fibrillation. Um, you potentially would have to cardiovert him to, to see if there is both entrance and exit block. And if there are signals, you may want to perform maneuvers in sinus rhythm. So a few things I'll just add to that, Siva, as uh, uh, points. So, you know, just for anyone who's new in EP, so you know this concept of entrance and exit block is we have this line of ablation or circle of ablation, and we want to show that the vein and atrium have no electrical continuity between them. So if the patient is in atrial fibrillation, as Siva pointed out, as you're ablating in the atrium to try to create this, you'll have initially AFib and AFib-like arrhythmias in the vein. Now, while you're ablating, each site, the local electrogram will decrease or fragment each site, but there'll be no change in the pattern of the signals in the vein. That'll stay exactly the same until you're close to or actually complete the circle. And you have an abrupt loss of signals in the vein, abrupt loss of signals in the vein. That's actually a really good marker for entrance block because you're bombarding your line with all kinds of wavefronts on one side and you're not able to get it. Now for exit block, it's true that you can't look for exit block the same way. You can't pace and see, did I get out to the atrium? But there are a few things that would tell you that you probably don't have to worry about exit block. And what those are, are if you have an independent rhythm in the pulmonary vein, if you consistently see an independent rhythm in the pulmonary vein, and it's not suppressed at all, it's like such good entrance block that no matter how much source sink mismatch you have, the chance you'll be able to exit out is very low. The other is if you pace and you can capture the vein, this is important, especially with balloon ablation, because sometimes you might lose the signals just because you're ablated a little bit into the vein and you've lost the signals in the venous myocardium. 
So still that attempt to check for exit block is useful because if you pace and capture, it means there's muscle still alive here. It's just that your captured wavefront is met by this line, so AFib can't get in. Theoretically, you don't know if your pacing can't get out, but if this is holding true, even after five, 10 minutes from your ablation, very good chance when you do cardiovert, you'll find that there is exit block in the vein as well. Anything you'd like to add to that, Abhishek? Otherwise, we'll go to the next question. I think this is perfect. Okay. So the next question and uh, related to this is how do you get to an excluded chamber in a patient post-congenital heart disease to complete the ablation? So I'll just share very quickly here uh, an example of where this can be relevant is a situation like this, where we have a patient post Fontan, baffle, patch, that's map the circuit of flutter on one side and you can't quite get the whole circuit length. If you can't get the circuit length, you have to be wary that there is a portion of atrium on the other side of the surgical site. And that other side does have conduction that can allow continuation of the flutter, even if you ablated on this one side. So there the issue is even entrainment on one side may be perfect, but your ablation just going from the baffle to IVC may not be sufficient because you have leaks where you can go to the other side and continue the conduction. So that's where it becomes an issue. How do I get there? So specific question is trans baffle puncture and uh, uh, other approaches to get there. I'll ask Brian to comment on trans baffle puncture, but I would like to point out that remember that always also keep all your options in mind. So if you have a patient who has IVC, SVC, right atrium, a neo-left atrium in continuity with the left atrium because of surgical patch here, it may still be possible to get there without necessarily puncturing the patch. If you have a large VSD, you could get retrograde across the VSD and get to the site. If it's functionally a single ventricle, you could get retrograde aorta and get your catheter here. If the ventricular septum is intact, you might be able to prolapse your retrograde transaortic catheter through the left AV valve, through a big continuity between left atrium and this neo left atrium and get your catheter there. So these are technically difficult maneuvers, but there are always options to keep in mind if you just have a high risk baffle puncture because of calcium, or because our way to get across the baffle is not straightforward. But Brian, some uh, comments about puncturing baffles. Sure, um, I think the, the first comment I'd have is it's, it's very difficult to do. Um, when we used to only have transeptal needles, there's a little bit of a risk of perforating outside the heart because you have to use quite a bit of force to get through. Now that there are radio frequency wires and, and other things, it is a little more straightforward doing so, but I guess the key point is, you know, just like real estate, location, location, location. You have to very well plan out where you're going to make the connection, make sure that there's a lot of scar around that area so you don't get bleeding. You have to be careful. Most of the time, you will not necessarily put sheaths through there, but you certainly can, but it can be very challenging to get to places retrograde. You may sometimes have to do a baffle puncture, but it's usually very thick calcified material and you may need to use such things as ice 
transesophageal echocardiogram or even angiography to determine the best place to make a baffle puncture that also will be likely to close on its own. At that point, I think you should involve cardiac surgery and your interventional catheterization colleagues so that if you get into a place that you don't want to or create an unstable hemodynamic situation, uh, you can have them either assist you in closing it or getting you out of that situation. Great. So, you know, one thing that, uh, Brian, you pointed out is calcium on a baffle. And it's always a good thing when you're thinking about baffle puncture to do cine fluoroscopy and try to do the cine fluoroscopy in a view that catches the patch in orthogonal views and look to see, do you see evidence of calcium? So although shadowing with the ice uh, may be a marker for this, I've, uh, I've been surprised how many times with ice, it looks like nothing there we should be okay, but then you do cine and you see clear calcium. And it's not a good idea to push that out into the circulation while doing, even if you successfully go with the thing, with the, with the puncture. Using an RF needle, using cautery, uh, are techniques uh, some, some folks use for getting across. Uh, definitely if standard, just pressure with the transeptal isn't working, you could do it. If you have uh, a patient who has, uh, uh, a, if you have an RF needle, you could try that. If not, if you're using cautery, just a few caveats is one is uh, you should use the regular monopolar cautery. The bipolar cautery pens are not enough to do to get you energy to do the puncture. Remember that make sure you have a fresh sheath in. What I mean by that is if you have a sheath for the needle, your transeptal puncture sheath and dilator have been used and traumatized, there may be breaks. And when you cautery, you could deliver energy to the ventricle. You don't want that to happen. So as a practice, if I'm going to use cautery, I'll just switch out sheets when uh, doing it at that time. And technique is you get the needle. With ice, you make sure that the needle is uh, onto it. And then you just take simple cautery, like what we use in the pacing lab, and then put the cautery on the raw end of the needle to see if we uh, uh, deliver it to the tip. You'll see some bubbles appearing on the tip. And then while that's you see the bubbles, it's forward pressure to try to get across in that needle. Now, Brian, one uh, thing is this is, of course, a whole different level of difficulty when it's an extra cardiac conduit. So we actually have an extra cardiac conduit and we've got cardiac tissues here. So here we fundamentally are leaving the chambers. We're actually exiting and re-entering. So the chance that we might have bleeding that could even be surgically difficult to correct is very significant. So, you know, some of the things that we would look at is careful look at imaging, a sit down talk with the CV radiologist, very familiar with this type of anatomy to see are these juxtaposed? Is there a place where a large atrium, for example, is against this? Then we're like more willing to do the puncture. Another is after the puncture is done, we're always going to leave a wire and then watch with eyes to see is there bleeding. Because if there is, we might have to be ready to close this percutaneously, having the right personnel, equipment, type of fluoroscopy, ready to try to close it to avoid like a surgical catastrophe. Uh, anything else anyone would like to add? I, I agree with you completely. I, I think you have to be very well prepared. And if you're going puncturing through baffles, whether they're intracardiac baffles, extracardiac baffles, you have to have a very good idea of the anatomy, where you're going, how you're going to get there, and then how you're going to close. But more importantly, what are you going to do if you end up in a space or with bleeding that you don't want? Thanks, Brian. So this next question um, is a very practical question. It's asking how important is it to ablate all potential isthmuses 
rather than you know get the clinical flutter or clinical tachycardia and then just leave everything else alone so you know obviously no golden answers to these but let's just take a few comments this is a very similar question that comes up in structural heart vt uh, as well but it always comes up in congenital heart atrial arrhythmias so maybe i'll get some thoughts from uh, 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 Dr. Kilu, uh, and then uh, uh, our, 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 uh, how about Siva? Do you want to give us some thoughts? Yeah, no. Um, I, I think it's 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 uh, when when we're dealing with congenital heart flutter, trying to target all the potential isthmus, you know, based on the prior history, where the potential slow zones would be, sometimes targeting abnormal electrograms um, is, is reasonable to do as within the timing of the procedural constraints. Uh, but in the end, you know, aggressive program stimulation to see what the acute outcome is, is also very reasonable. Great. Um, and Abhishek, any thoughts? So Practical question, do you, what do you do? Like, do you clinical flutter, ablate, done, go? Or do you recognize isthmuses and ablate all of them? I think it happens all the time, especially if when you have more than one flutter which is going on at the same time or you induce a second flutter during the same case. So certainly my approach would be to target the clinical flutter what you have. If it is not a CTI dependent flutter, try to do a CTI line as well. And then try to see if you have more flutters. Because as Dr. Cannon pointed out, you also don't want to ablate over aggressively in the atrium to isolate part of atrium to cause more atrial dyssynchrony, sinus node dysfunction, and all the other challenges which can happen. And there is always can be a, another day if a second flutter shows up. So I would target the clinical flutter and maybe target the CTI. Yep, so that, that is one approach uh, to, to do it, and you've given a rationale. What about you, Brian? Uh, you know, I, I'd say that you know, if you take a look at these, a lot of times the whole atrium is diseased. And if you do a map, there's three quarters of the atrium that has low voltage signals and slow conduction. So the approach I usually take is, is um, I agree, because about 30% of congenital heart disease flutters are still CTI dependent. So the CTI line is your friend, and I don't ever have a problem with putting that in as a bonus lesion. I think if you're gonna go after all the circuits that you see anatomically, you're gonna probably be in there all day and realize that in some of these congenital hearts, the atrium can be a centimeter thick. So a single line, even with a saline tip cooled ablation catheter, may be very difficult to make one line. So my approach has been, is agree, go for the clinical flutter, Isthmus burn is, is always a reasonable thing to do. And then see if you induce anything else. Because if you look at the recurrence rate, it's pretty high. It's about 50% after five years for this. So these other circuits may become clinically relevant. But my thought is, is if they're not inducible at that time, you could spend all day in there ablating all these little circuits without much uh, clinical success. Well, you know, uh, yeah, uh, thanks, Brian. So, so just, just for uh, fairness, you know, different groups, different electrophysiologists have different approaches. And, uh, you know, the early work that showed the relevance of isthmus, how to recognize on a mapping system, a lot of that work was from Dr. Nakagawa, Dr. Jackman, and have emphasized complete ablation. That is, if you recognize a circuit ablated. Uh, I can just maybe briefly go over my own approach, maybe a little bit of hybrid from what we heard from uh, Abhishek and uh, some of the classical work. So, you know, the, the issue is the one thing that uh, Abhishek alluded to is if we have several areas of scar or very poor conduction, when we do an ablation for one isthmus or circuit, if that's the clinical tachycardia, we are making more of a boundary for other arrhythmias. Uh, 
the more boundary you make, the more likely those arrhythmias are going to come. This is just an electrophysiological fact. So we have to keep in mind that if we do an ablation in a diseased heart, it's not only could this be a future flutter, but if what I have done is making it more likely for another flutter. And the simplest way to do that is program stimulation. So if in the beginning of the procedure, all you induced was one, after you do the ablation, even if you've shown block across the line that you've created, it's a good idea to do program stimulation. And if you do program stimulation and you're readily and reproducibly inducing a stable flutter, the writing is on the wall. It's not enough, I don't think, to say this is non-clinical. You already have a good map. You have a good idea where potential boundaries can be. It shouldn't take too much time or effort to map and ablate that. So I think that's an easy case scenario but of what you should do. But the more difficult one is what if you have recognized extremely slow conduction? Even if you can't induce flutter, should you still ablate them? And at least my way of thinking about that is risk-benefit ratio for everything that we do in this type of arrhythmias. So what is that risk-benefit? We think of three things. How likely is that ablation to be pro-arrhythmic? In other words, how big a line and how difficult is it to ablate in that tissue? Because what you never want to do is make slower conduction. Second is how likely am I to affect the conduction system, specifically isolate the sinus node? And third is how likely am I to produce significant atrial dyssynchrony? So how to kind of answer that is if you found slow conduction, chances are the isthmus is small. So rather than just physically saying I've got valve and scar, look at the conduction in between. And if it is slow, very, very good chance that you have a narrow isthmus. Why is that? Because wavefront curvature has to condense to make for slow conduction. And what will force that curve to increase in a wave front is a narrow isthmus. If it's just disease tissue and the neighboring tissue is fine and there's a big isthmus, you'll never get slow conduction. It just won't conduct. It'll conduct through the neighboring sites. So in addition to looking at scar and potential isthmus, look at the conduction velocity at that site. And if that looks really slow, bunched up signals as you're going through, that means it's narrow. The chance that you're going to cause dyssynchrony, et cetera, is small. Go ahead and ablate. Now, two caveats to this. Why wouldn't you just induce tachycardia? Because if this is so slow, you're going to induce it anyway. Maybe it's a slow conduction to a dead area in the heart, dead end. The problem with induction is if you randomly pick a site to induce, you may pick a site that to this particular slow zone has got two wave fronts coming into it. You'll never induce. You'll have to get the right extra stem to block one and get the other. So if you use stimulation protocols purely, then make sure you do multiple sites. So you know where the likely slow zones are, where the isthmuses are, do your stim on both sides. Or if you find it's really narrow and you've demonstrated slow conduction, go ahead and ablate it. Now, question of isolating the sinus node is very important and it's very hard to predict. I've personally had a case, consciously thought about this, thought about where we do the drains, leave this alone, did the line, and isolated the sinus node. Completely did not anticipate it happening. And that's because sometimes we miss some scar. We don't know where exactly the sinus node exit is. So it is a problem. Good rule of thumb is don't do lines on both sides of the crystal terminalis. If you keep your linear ablation to one side of the crystal terminalis, posterior 
are anterior, it's highly unlikely you'll isolate the sinus node. That's just kind of a rule of rule of thumb I personally uh, use for this type of thing. In terms of dyssynchrony, another little rule of thumb is even if you isolate the free wall of the right atrium, it's not going to affect atrial synchrony. So in other words, where this comes up is you've done a line going from SVC to a lateral scar and maybe took it to the IVC, still had conduction, but now what you did is did a cavotricuspidismus line. Good bet you'll isolate a portion of the right atrial free wall. Now we never like to isolate, but in general, this atrium is so diseased in patients that we have these issues that the contribution of that portion of the lateral atrium to the overall atrial contraction is probably small. And sometimes I don't mind, and maybe even I like to see this because it tells me both these lines are great. Very different story if you're doing lines closer to the septum or in the left atrium on the roof. There, the issue is not isolation, but you can get severe dyssynchrony between the right and the left atrium. That can be a big problem. Patients can get high wedge pressures, pulmonary edema, things like that. So just some kind of tips, how you've heard different approaches, just how you kind of try to answer that question. I think all of us would agree though, whenever we do a line, in addition to checking for block, you do program stem at the end of the procedure. I mean, unless of course the patient is very sick or something like that. So uh, maybe what we'll do is we'll keep the remaining questions to try and incorporate in our next uh, congenital heart session. Uh, we can maybe call it a day at this point. Thanks a lot, everybody.